At the Alouettes, we believe that crossing the end zone is not the only thing that matters. We believe our impact is felt beyond the field. We believe that strength and speed are nothing without consistency and perseverance. We believe in our next generation and their talent. Here, in this province, our sport is healthy. We believe that in order to move forward, it's essential to know one's past and that we can offer you heroes and role models. We believe we can make you laugh, sing, dance, and even cry. We believe that no matter the language we speak or where we come from, we will always come together to shout loud and clear. And that it's not only a city behind us, but a whole province. A province that meets every season in a mythical place where the courage and talent of dedicated athletes shine. A place sparkling with the presence of those who with their cries and their joy illuminate it every week. Together, Let's light up the stadium. Hi, this is Corey Ramirez with Montreal Alouettes. I'm Rob's next guest on Rob's Inner Circle, so stay right there. We'll be right back. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Robert Delessa, the host of Rob's Inner Circle, broadcasting live from Montreal, Canada. We have an exciting show for you folks tonight. A beautiful event going on. We have a giveaway on tonight's show. We have two pairs of tickets to the next Montreal Alouettes home game against the Ottawa Red Blacks. will be in town on Friday, November 19th. So you want to stick around for a chance to win. I want to give a shout out to our amazing producer, Jenny Duhame, and to the podcast techie on our show, Patty, Lady Starlight Saragossa. Some honorable mentions. This past Saturday, Patty, Jenny, and myself, and my sweetheart, were the guests at the Walk Cafe. For those of you who remember, two weeks ago, we had Jimmy and Matthew Chan on our show. Well, their family-owned restaurant, a walk cafe run by a mother, wife, Susan Chan. We had a chance uh, to meet up uh, with these amazing people, and they served us the best dinner we have ever had. The food is of superb quality. Their signature dish, the General Tao Chicken, you have to have the General Tao Chicken, is absolutely fantastic. Friendly service, delightful people. Congratulations to Jimmy and all of your family. You have an amazing restaurant. Their Walk Cafe, they have two locations. Uh, the first one, 3510 Sources Boulevard in Dollar Desormo, and the other one at 118 Barry Street in Kirkland. On Thursday, November 25th, our past guest, Jimmy Chan's Saving Chinatown, the, Raise, the Rise of the Dragons, will be presented at the Zensa Media International Film Festival. Be sure to get your tickets through the email on your screen right now by mentioning Rob's Inner Circle, because they're going by really fast. We have some birthdays to underline that will be happening this upcoming week. Famed Canadian film director Jim Donovan, the amazing lead singer from the box Jean-Marc Pisapia, and the super talented frontman Tim Steinruck from The Mighty One. Tim got off the most amazing Alberta tour and Rise Up reality tour, and he will be embarking on the next one in British Columbia, all thanks to Nanaimo Tourism and 64 Audio from November 23rd to November 27th. You can follow them at Rise Up TV. Rise Up TV, Big Records, at the Rise Up TV and Big Records, will be joining forces with Bobby Short Short's YouTube channel this month for a Men's Awareness Month for November. Just click on the link be uh, below on the screen and you can find out some more information. 
Stay tuned on our Facebook page for some amazing Movents, and they're coming soon. You don't want to miss that. The Noon Hour Out of the Box podcast I co-host with Esther Brzezinski is now on Access Internet Radio every Saturday between noon and 3 p.m. You want to tune in for some really good listening. We have an amazing show. That's Noon Hour Out of the Box every Saturday between noon and 3 p.m. on accessradio.ca. The Daily Struggles sitcom is up and running on the Rise Up TV channel and the Roku streaming service. If you want to watch our show, you're in for a treat. There's a lot of fun stuff going on there. And if you don't have the streaming stick, you can get one on Amazon for as little as $30. All of the Rob's Inner Circle merchandise is available at the 514brandingco.com merch store. That's 514brandingco.com. We have some amazing t-shirts. We've got some mugs, a lot of collectible items that you certainly want to have among your collectibles. We encourage you to visit the Bobby Short Shorts YouTube channel. Go ahead and check out our productions in our playlists. You want to hit the like button, want to comment, share our productions. And subscribe to the Bobby Short Shorts YouTube channel. And most of all, you want to hit that notification bell because every time there's something new coming out, you will be the first to know. Well, folks, it's that time once again. It's time to slip into our weekly ritual. It's time to sit back, relax, kick up your feet on the edge of the table, and let us carry the load. We have another exciting show. And it, it is our honor to have this amazing guest on our show tonight. He is a senior account manager at the Montreal Alouettes. He's worked at HMV, at Nike, and he's done a lot of things with himself. And now he's an amazing guy working for an amazing organization. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome tonight's star attraction, Mr. Corey Ramirez. Corey. <laughs> hey, how you doing, Robert? Thanks for having me. Appreciate I it. I am totally excited to have such a great guy on our show. We are blessed, Corey. Oh, nice. That's nice for you to say, Robert. The feeling's mutual. Thanks for having me. Corey, we have a lot to cover over here. So without further ado, as they say in the business, Corey, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? Where were you born? I was born in the States, Robert. I was born in the lovely city of New York and uh, been here uh, since I was a little kid. So didn't get a chance to see New York per se, uh, but at the same time, grew up in the South Shore, um, not too far from uh, where I am now and uh, been enjoying life ever since. So, um, you know, I'm happy to be here. Have you gone back to visit New York over uh, some time? Well, uh, not since the pandemic, obviously, uh, with the border crossing and all that. But I, I try to get to uh, New York every maybe three, four years. So to this day, mm. you're a huge New York Islanders fan. Oh, you remember that, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Corey, you know what? I, I just thought I would just show you a little bit of a treat, something to spark your interest a little bit here, okay? I just, okay. I'm just i going to show you something over here. And tell us if you know... Who this gentleman is? Hey, it's Battling ba Billy. <laughs> <laughs> Take a look at that Billy mask, Smith. Corey. Take Billy a look Smith. at that mask, man. Oh, that's a great mask. That's a great mask. And then he uh, he went on later to change that mask for that. Uh, I, I call it the uh, that cage. The cage. The, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, it just doesn't make the cut. You know, the masks they're wearing nowadays. You know, these were masks. No, hey, I mean, listen, that's look look, that's that. classic. Look at that. Look at that. <laughs> That looks and, like a Halloween costume. Look, and oh, how Chico. about this guy? Hey, that's Chico Resch. Oh, man, you, <laughs> you're pulling out all the stops tonight. <laughs> and so, oh, Corey, we also have oh, a moment that was captured forever. Okay. And this is this is uh, probably what really made you love the Islanders at that very moment. Oh, Bob Nystrom. He's nice. Scoring the, scoring um, the overtime goal against Philadelphia against... Yep. The yep. poor P. Uh, what, what's his name? Uh, Peters. Peters. What's his last name? There? You talk about uh, Peter. Pe uh, Pete Peters. <laughs> See, even you twisted your tongue Pete over Peters? that one. <laughs> That's a tongue twister. Pete, Peter. Pete, Peter. Yeah. Well, it's Pete not Peter Peters, Piper. Like, one up the Piper. No, one, no, no. Whatever. Pete Peters. I believe that was. Oh it, man. 
Pete Peters, poor Pete Peters. That's my youth, Robert. That's my youth. Now you got me all happy now. Okay. Okay. That's a cut. That's it. We're done. (laughs) So speaking about youth, let's go back to your youth and tell us what your youth was like as you were youthing your way through your youth. Yeah, well, well, boy, that's a lot of use there. <laughs> a lot of euphemisms used. Right? Well, um, listen, uh, you know, I had a I had a fun childhood. You know, I, I think uh, I was talking to a buddy of mine not too long ago. We were talking about street hockey and some of the things that you can't do uh, nowadays that we did. Uh, you know, growing up in a time where everything was a little bit slower and you knew your neighbors and you're able to um, trust other people and so forth. You know, you got to know everyone in the neighborhood and, um, it wasn't a punishment to go outside and play where it is now (laughs) in so many words, but it it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, you know, I was very active in sports. Um, uh, my parents encouraged it and, uh, it, it, it gave me a lot of values that I have now. And I think it stems from uh, my upbringing in that. And um, it gave me an opportunity to meet a lot of different types of people as well. What was the predominant sport in your life as you were growing up? You there, Corey? Oh, something happened here. I think we lost Corey. Corey, are you there? I'm still here, Robert. So okay. I was talking about I was talking about street hockey and stuff like that. I don't know if uh, if everyone heard me, but anyways, okay, <laughs> I'm no, still I, here. I, then I went on to ask you about what your the predominant sport was as you were growing up. Oh, I didn't hear that part, but thanks for repeating okay. that. So uh, the predominant sport, well, when I was a kid, I played a lot of street hockey. Uh, I was in baseball uh, as I got older and went to high school. It was a lot of basketball. And obviously throughout my life, uh, playing a lot of pickup football and, and and stuff like that. So I had a lot of you know, it's like my mother told me, focus on one thing instead of being jack of all traits, master of none. <laughs> well, I remember when I was a youth myself, we used to play a lot of touch football. Mm-hmm. It was especially fun with the girls would uh, come and play with us. Well, that's it. I think that, you know, touch football is kind of equivalent to now uh, where you have flag football, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, the, the thing that's fun about flag football and touch football back in the day, as you alluded, it's inclusive, right? So everyone everyone can participate. So even if you, you know, if you're scared of being tackled or whatever the case may yeah. be, it's, you know, two hand <laughs> touch or one hand touch. And I remember the girls were always out running us for some reason. Maybe they were wearing the Nike shoes. Who knows? Well, well yeah, <laughs> just do it. But uh, no. That's a... So, Corey, tell, tell hey, we got Raul tuning in. He's a great fan of ours. He's from uh, Los, yeah, the Los Angeles area. Nice. Los Angeles, California. Thanks nice. for tuning in, Raul. And thanks to everybody for tuning hey, in. Hey, Raul. Thanks for, thanks for supporting us. <laughs> Okay, yeah, you have some uh, American players in the Montreal LOS. Uh, is there anybody from California, Los Angeles? Oh boy, Robert, you're putting me on the spot here. Um, I don't, uh, I don't know <laughs> where some of these guys are from. I'm sure we have we we have a great representation of a lot of people from the states and obviously from Canada. Uh, I'm sure there's probably a couple of people from the California area. I know Vernon is from. Oh, actually, Vernon's from California now that I mentioned. Yes, Vernon's from California. And we also have retired quarterback Anthony Calvillo, who was from Los Angeles. Oh, that was – okay. I yeah. didn't know where he grew up. Okay. Okay. Uh, did you um, did you take part in any organized sports as you were growing up? Yeah, predominantly – well, <laughs> I – why I'm laughing is that, I, you know, as, as we've talked on many of occasions, I, I'm a big football fan, right? Uh, but I ended up playing youth football uh, when I was a kid for a miserable team. Uh, a lot of people don't even realize we actually had a team uh, in this borough. Was, I grew up in Broussard, and uh, we actually had a football team for a couple of minutes. And and we were just bad. We, we were <laughs> bad. But uh, recently, by working at the Alouettes, um, I had an opportunity to meet uh, a gentleman that actually played on the same team as me. Um, and it was funny. We talked about a whole bunch of football and and uh, we were talking about the, our days in Broussard playing. And you know, it, it's good memories. And I'm surprised that I still like football to this day based on the experience that I had. It, it was miserable, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know. But uh, so, you know, to answer your question, football, and I played a little baseball as a kid. And baseball was my first love um, when I was growing up. So I played a, a little organized baseball. Let's get a little up close and personal here. Mm. You graduated from Centennial Regional High School. 
Oh boy, you're doing who, your homework. Uh, who knows, like how mm -hmm. many years ago? We, we don't want to get into that. That's not important. I think four or five. Yeah, yeah. Four or five years ago. That's pretty yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> that took me that long to graduate. It took me that long to figure things out. You know. Tell us, Corey, what is or what are your most cherished memories from Centennial Regional High School? Oh boy, we how much time do we have? We have uh, we have an hour, two hours. I don't know. Uh, an um, hour. Hour. Okay, so I can go on. No, uh, in all <laughs> honesty, uh, <laughs> uh, Centennial was a nice school. Uh, you know, I had uh, you know a lot of people that I still talk to right now uh, from high school. Um, you know, the thing that I liked is that it was very multicultural school. Um, everyone got along with each other, um, and um, you know, it was. A microcosm of society. It was. It was. It was. It was nice to uh, uh, come from a, a nice place because a lot of times people talk about their 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 high school experience and um, it was hard. You know, it was, it was a lot of hardship for them or people going through different uh, you know growing pains per se. And I can't even say that about high school. High school I found was uh, a lot of fun. A lot of fun. So, which teachers to this day that you? still remember that you still hold very much at heart uh i have mr livingston mr livingston was uh, one of our french teachers uh, a nice gentleman uh that you know kept us in line and uh you know he was one of these guys that went the extra mile uh miss epson uh you know uh, she was our english teacher you know she she um uh, helped us understand like uh, Shakespeare. We went into like, you know, Othello and, and novels like that, great literature and, you know, and Mice and Men and things like this. Like these are a couple of teachers that, you know, went the extra mile, which, you know, I appreciate, you know. So as you headed mm -hmm. out of high school, you graduated. Mm -hmm. uh, what at that moment, what were your ambitions as you were moving along in life? Well, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to, you know, I went and did my CJEP at Champlain and I wanted to uh, go into psychology. Um, and what I ended up noticing by my studies and stuff, um, you know, I ended up doing a lot of work in the public. And then I kind of, I wouldn't say sidetracked. I just think that I put things on the back burner, as some people do. And I got into the job force and I had an opportunity to work for a lot of, a lot of, good companies, uh, which gave me the opportunity to kind of grow my wings and, um, and, and and the rest is history. You learned pretty early on that you had some good communication skills through your experience mm -hmm. and all that. And that's what prepared the turf for you for your future. So how did you discover yeah. that you had this passion and this talent? Well, I you know, talent is a is a strong word. I think that, you know, I can't say that I have a talent for it. Maybe I have a knack for it. Maybe um, maybe it comes easily. It's for other people to say if it's a talent or not. But um, I think it's more of a mindset. I think it was just more or less um, helping people and providing a good service. And then uh, and then it called, you know, then it uh, how can I say it? I was able to uh, turn it into something else, right? So, uh, you know, I didn't set off to work at some of the companies that I have. Um, but at the same time, um, I think it's just basically doing the best that you can while you're at a particular situation and, and seeing where it leads you. And I've been very fortunate that it's led me in a lot of positive directions, a lot of positive uh, opportunities, and got a chance to meet a lot of interesting people, uh, which at that point have helped me grow that skill set that's pretty much it well as many important behind the scenes figures that play an interesting role in the entertainment industry you had a meaningful stint at hmv so how did this experience shape your life and your career well i think that hmv um gave me an opportunity to you know when i talked about you know having a multicultural um environment at 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 Centennial, uh, I think that HMV kind of accelerated it. You know, it gave me the opportunity to work downtown for the first time. It gave me the opportunity to come across uh, different people from different walks of life, even more than I did in the in the suburbs of of Greenfield Park, going to Centennial. And it, it showed you people came from different backgrounds, but at the same time, they all had a passion for music. Um, I, I have always enjoyed being around passionate people. It doesn't matter what you're passionate about, as long as you're passionate about something. 
And, you know, a lot of these people are trying to get you to uh, embrace their music, right? So we all love music, but we all like different types of music. And if you're open-minded enough, what can happen is that you can discover something new. So we're all sponges and we're all feeding off of each other. But at the same time, we're trying to pull each other to a different direction as far as music. You know, you give someone an inch, they want to go even further, you know. So how long did you work at the HMV? Uh, HMV, it was about uh, four or five years. I think it's four years. It was four years, uh, four excellent years. Um, that was such a great experience. You know, mm-hmm. it was such a great experience. With such a love for music, do you play in instruments? Do you sing? I, I can imagine you must be a great singer, Corey. No, 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 no. Not at all? There's no, there's, no, there's no singing here. There's no singing whatsoever, no shape and form. Uh, you know what? Maybe if you get some donations, maybe uh, <laughs> donations for a good cause. Oh, I saw something regarding Movember or something. We get to do something for Movember. Maybe I'll sing. We'll see. We'll see. Well, we maybe, we, maybe we can <laughs> talk after this show, my friend. Yeah, well, we'll see what we can do. <laughs> you know? The reason the reason why I brought, I brought up your singing talents, folks, because before the, uh, we aired, Corey went on to his um, – um, he went on to sing uh, – uh, what's that song? Jean Alouette? Listen, Robert, I'm not even going there. Don't even try. <laughs> don't, don't even try. That's going to be that's going to be a great sound bite. As much as I'd like to do it right now, I'm scared that you'll keep that and hold it over my head. So no, no, there's no, not don't worry, be, uh, no you know, danger. No, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> so Corey, you ended up working at uh, a Nike store in the Laurentians. Yeah. So, uh, so tell us about that experience. That that was a lot of fun. Um, you know. It, <laughs> when I worked at when I worked at HMV, um, it was a lot of fun, and sometimes I would, I would be decked out in some HMV, oh, excuse me, in, in in Nike stuff, and you know I'd have my mother come into the store uh, every once in a while, and I was part of management, and she would tell me, "Where are you going to go in life wearing Nike from A to Z? You look like a billboard." And some <laughs> and, and some people thought I was sponsored by Nike because I wore so much Nike at that time. And then the transition was the next job that I got was actually uh, doing sales and marketing for Nike and Saint Silver. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so it was it was a, it was a, it was a nice transition. It was a nice transition, and so, it gave you an opportunity to uh, like I lived in the Laurentians. Like, you know, how great is that? You know, you finish work and you're on the ski hills in 15 minutes. Not even. Oh, you know? yeah. It, it must have been beautiful. It was. It was. I spent a couple of years in the Laurentians, and I enjoyed myself immensely. I, I know you've held other positions as well, but we we want to keep it just a little bit brief because we have a lot of material to cover. We're going to be getting into uh, your uh, your present stint with the LOS. But before we go to that, mm-hmm. uh, you went from HMV to Nike, and then you went to some kind of a uh, telecommunication firm. So yeah. you, you acquired quite a bit of experience at that position as well. Well, yeah, I, I think that um, you know when I when I joined, I think you're alluding to MemberWorks. It's uh, you know MemberWorks just for people that aren't aware of that is just it's a company that deals with it. It was a loyalty program. So um, back in the you know now we have loyalty everywhere. We have uh, loyalty gas cards. We have grocery stores and so forth. And MemberWorks was a company that was uh, helping other companies with loyalty programs. So we were we were selling some of these services and, and so forth. And it was my first time working in an environment working on the phones. Uh, when I actually worked at HMV and, and Nike, uh, these were all customer service jobs, sales jobs, where it was a lot of face-to-face. So working at uh, MemberWorks gave me an opportunity to um, talk to people over the phones, hone my skills as well as a as a salesperson, but also developing uh, material for companies to, um, uh, how can I say it, um, integrate new employees to the workforce as well. So that was part of my responsibility at, at MemberWorks. And it was a great, it was a great learning experience. And I spent like uh, nearly eight years there. Well, that's totally amazing. <clears throat> We're going to be going into your present position, but before we go to that, folks, you have an amazing guest on our show tonight. He's uh, the senior account manager at the Montreal LOS. If you have any questions, Corey will be more than happy to oblige. And please do not ask him to sing because he won't. No, 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 I won't. <laughs> no, no, no. 
Corey, you're presently holding the position at the LOS that we just mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, tell us uh, how it is that you got involved with the LOS. And at the same time, you are very blessed because you're, you're actually fulfilling two passions, your love for sports and your love for sales. So tell mm -hmm. us all about your position at the Montreal LOS. Well, I've been working at the LOS. Thanks, Robert. Uh, I've been working at the LOS for five years now. And my role is just basically to make people happy. Well, <laughs> is is to provide that wow factor, right? So, um, you know, at the end of it, it's my job is to bring people to the fan uh, to the games, uh, but it's also to figure out why they're coming to the games and how to engage our fans and uh, how to make um, the experience a lot of fun. So um, I wear a lot of different hats on certain kind of days. So, you know, taking care of season ticket holders, um, you know, helping uh, youth organizations and schools with fundraising opportunities uh, with, with, with our ticket sales. So what happens is we can give a portion of the ticket sales to the youth organization. Um, so instead of selling chocolate bars, <laughs> you know, you get a ticket, you know, it's better, uh, it's better for your waistline that way as well. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, you know, we, we bring a lot of kids, we give people opportunity, like the last game, we had uh, some people from um, an organization that, you know, kids weren't able to um, come to a game, we had a generous a person donate a hundred tickets and, you know, I had the opportunity to, to find an organization um, that I felt was very needy of that. And we had a whole bunch of kids come to a game uh, last week in the rain and the whole nine. So it's, um, you know, working at the Alouettes is, a, is really rewarding um, and, and it's fun. And, you know, I think you mentioned before culminating two passions of mine, uh, one obviously being sports, and the other one is providing the service. So that's sales element to it. So uh, you kind of kill two birds with one stone, so to speak. A reminder to you, to the audience, stick around, folks. We are going to be giving away two pairs of tickets to the next Alouettes game. That's this upcoming Friday, November 19th, when the Ottawa Red Blacks are going to be in town. So yeah, they're going to be on the corner. They're in trouble. They're in trouble. <laughs> they're in trouble this Friday. So people come out, come out and support us. <laughs> And watch us um... win another game. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, this is a family show, so I can't go into the big words on yeah, what we're going to okay, do. So, Corey, yeah, you win. know what? If you say it, it's going to sound biased. So, you know what? Let me say it. Hmm. Alouettes win. There you go. There How's you that? Go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly it. Corey, you were at a crossroads at one point. You had three job offers on the table. Two of them were absolutely interesting. And mm -hmm. one of them was right close to your house. We said, uh -uh, not going to have that. You ended up going to the Alouettes. So what is it that attracted you about the Alouettes? Well, it seemed to be uh, a no-brainer. I'm a sports guy, right? I'm a sports guy. Um, you know, I'm an avid uh, nowadays, like when I, you know, I think we talked about a little bit earlier about some of the sports that I did as a kid, but, you know, as, as an adult, you know, you, you kind of change some of those sports as well. Uh, you can't be playing football every day anymore. So, you know, obviously I ski now, I skate a little bit, uh, you know, I play occasional pickup basketball and, you know, I still organize an annual football game with me and my friends in the winter every year. But, um, one of the things that brought me to the Alouettes was the fact that, um, I was able to work for myself in a sense. Um, in some of the previous jobs I had, uh, which you know I, I feel I did very well in, is that I managed I managed a lot of people. So I managed anywhere from twenty people to fifty people on any given uh, project or any given year, depending on which company I was working for. And then the thing that was appealing with Alouettes was the fact that you know what I was able to you know. Um, bring my product or our product, the Alouettes, to the masses, and I'm only responsible for myself. So, and that was something that I hadn't done in over 20 years. So I was uh, I was really happy to have that opportunity, and I took the ball, sorry for the pun, but I took the ball and I ran with it. Well, I guess the ball is in your court. Well, it was anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, last season, because of COVID, the CFL mm -hmm. had to cancel the season. So how yep. hurtful was that uh, cancellation of the season? And how are the Alouettes bouncing back? Well, it, it, it hurt. It hurt. Um, it hurt. 
on a lot of different levels, right? It, it, it hurt in the sense that 2019, we had a really good season. We were going in the right direction. Uh, we had new ownership. Uh, we had new management, all great people. And we were all excited. And then this little thing called COVID hit <laughs> and obviously turned the world upside down. And um, unfortunately, uh, you know, we had to deal with it. And um, but coming back from it, you know, people want to support the local team. People love their Alouettes. Uh, people love uh, the feel good story. So, you know, we're not, you know, we're not the huge juggernaut, let's call it what it is. But at the same time, uh, we are Montreal's team. Uh, we're accessible. We're, uh, we're close within the community. Uh, people can relate to us. Uh, we have players that are relatable. Uh, we have players that are accessible. Uh, you can't really say that in a lot of other sports. The Alouettes went from, uh, well, a couple of ownerships. They were owned by Robert Wettenhall. Then the CFL took over uh, governing duties mm -hmm. until they were sold to Gary Stern. Right. With this sale and the revamp of the team, in which way did this make the team better? Well, I, I think, you know, as far as better, I think that anytime you have people that believe in you makes you better as a person or organization and so forth. Right. So, uh, you know, uh, with, with Gary coming on board, Gary and his team and his, his love and passion. And, uh, you know, he's a great, he's, he's a great guy. Uh, I've had the opportunity to meet him a couple of times and the, what happens is it gives you a sense of energy and, you know, with our president and our, and our general manager and people from here and they're local. So what happens is it, all that energy snowballs, right? So it's from the top to the bottom. So if you're working in the office and you see these guys go by and you see the hours they're putting in or you hear them on the radio, um, you know, and, you know, they're coming by your desk and saying, hey, you know, listen, give, give this guy a call for me. You know, this is a guy you went to school with or, or so forth. Um, you know, that was something that was, you know, maybe lacking a little bit before, but, you know, we, we appreciate them and, um, you know, we're going to have even better days to come. You also have the cheerleaders, the LOS cheerleaders who are <laughs> very active among the community. Do you? That they are. Yeah. And to be a cheerleader, do you need some kind of special training? Well, you know, you might have to ask them about that. I don't know what kind of training they have. Uh, I know that they're great at what they do. Uh, they're very influential in the community, uh, especially during the pandemic. They went around, uh, brought joy to people, uh, some people that weren't able to um, come to our games or get out. They went and entertained people in some of the uh, the, um, the the senior residents and so forth. They performed on the street for them as they looked from their their apartments and so forth. So they're they're an integral part of what we do. You know, we we need their support. We need their energy, and you know, they energize us and they energize the crowd as well. Before we go to this video pertaining to the Montreal Alouettes cheerleader, here's a little FYI for the audience. <clears throat> There's many of you out there who are wondering what an Alouette is. And, you know, <laughs> translated to English, we're going to show you what an Alouette is and what it looks like. So the Montreal Alouettes are actually the Montreal Skylarks. Mm -hmm. And that's what a Skylark look like, mm -hmm. looks like. That's the Jancy Alouette that Corey was singing before we went on at the beginning of the show over here. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about, Robert. I have yeah, no idea all, what you're right? talking about. No, you know, we never did that, right? <laughs> I regret not recording that. Anyways, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, we're going to be showing you a little clip over here of the Montreal Alouettes cheerleaders. They're absolutely adorable, and they are so devoted to the community. Uh, congratulations to them and to the whole organization for making themselves so accessible and for being so good at what they do. amazing and you know the Alouettes have been in the community the cheerleaders yes you know they're part of the of the game and it's 10 games a season but they do over 150 uh, community appearance a year so we were missing that 
contact, without contact now, but we're pretty active on our social medias and we did a week for uh, the elderly and, you know, we were talking and we were talking about the families uh, and, you know, the elderlies who are, everybody's confined, but, you know, honestly, they're more confined than others. You know, we can take a walk, they can't. And so we were pretty um, touched, moved by all of this. I asked the cheerleaders, do you have families in centers? And then uh, I called and I said, how about we do a visit? And everybody was really excited. So we're starting today and we're hoping to do more. So if we can bring a little bit of hope and, and you know, sunshine, well, that makes us happy. We're really happy to be here. We're trying to stay positive. We, st we still believe in it. Um, we hope to have a season, but regardless of what's going on, the community can count on us. We want to be there for them. And you know what? At the same time, they're giving it back to us. So, yeah. So I really enjoy like the people coming out on the balconies with flags trying to say hi to us. Like we, we can see them from really high as you can see like the buildings are like 20 stories high but we can't really see them but with their flags it makes them visible to us and it's like yeah we're all there for each other uh, in these hard times. It's even better because we know they're there just for us and not all, only for the football. <laughs> I think it makes all of us feel good really. We've all been really uh, alone for during this quarantine so we've been been uh, zooming a lot between our teams because we can't practice together but we we're hopeful for a new se uh, a season for the CFL this year. We've been practicing uh, online with our teammates but this is the first time since quarantine that we've actually seen each other uh, face to face but we're still respecting like the distancing and uh, we're keeping our meters and we can't hug and that's really hard for us but we're glad to be here for the elderly so we're dancing for them it makes them happy it makes us happy to do what we love so yeah that's basically why we're doing it make everyone happy <laughs>
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, <laughs> geez, I, I didn't sign up for all this. But yeah, like if you look at it, you know, there's a couple of things to the sign, you know, and one of the things that, you know, they were talking about in some of the research and, you know, in developing a sign, a logo should be something that a kid should be able to draw, right? So that that's one thing. It's not to say that it's simple, but it should be something that, you know, you can emulate. But if you look at it, there's a couple of things that you see here, right? So you see the M, obviously the M for Montreal. And then you look at it and you can see a bird right so that's the alouette and uh it's supposed to be kind of like a fighter jet as well so you know i guess the take on the bird and the fighter jet and that's supposed to be part of the bergalion of uh and you know now you're putting me on the spot i don't know which <laughs> which uh which uh brigade but uh you know if you just people you can google so many things these days you can uh, get a little bit more information regarding that but that's the three-prong approach to that alouette so when it was unveiled a couple of years ago you know, I was like, uh, initially, I was like, hmm, interesting. Okay. And then, you know, you get to grow, it, it grows on you. And it's like, you kind of look at it and it's clean. It's neat. It's clean. Um, it's, you know, it's different from the other one where the angry bird is a little cartoonish. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's, uh, it's more a little, I don't want to say sophisticated, but it's a, it's a clean, nice look. Well, folks, it's time for the question. It's time for you to have a chance to win those tickets to the next Alouettes game. Uh, it's November 19th, this upcoming Friday, against the Ottawa Red Blacks. So, yes. folks, get ready. Get on your – I'm going to give you a clue. You can do this through Google. Okay, so get ready. Here's the question. And before we go on to do the question – the winner has to be vaccinated, double vaxxed, and uh, to be able to enter the facility. And it has to be according to the Quebec COVID-19 restrictions. Mm -hmm. Also, to participate, you must like and subscribe to our Bobby Short Shorts YouTube channel. Share this event to your Facebook page and join in the live chat on either Facebook Live or YouTube as you're doing right now. And that's how you can win. And you want to type in, this is your cue, I love the Montreal Alouettes. The winners are responsible for their own transportation. Rob's Inner Circle and their affiliates are not responsible for any incurred costs related to this promotion. Winners will be selected within two hours of the live show. So, folks, here's the question. Get ready. The Montreal Alouettes have won seven Grey Cups in their history. The first one came in 1949, the second one 1970, the third one 1974, the fourth one 1977, 2002, 2009, and they won one more Grey Cup. Here's the question. In which year did the Alouettes win the last, their last Grey Cup? So, Folks, good luck. We're going to be announcing who the winner is or the winners. We have two pairs of tickets. So whoever answers this question correctly will be earning these two pairs of tickets. We have, we're have we going to have two winners on the show. So, Corey, thank you very much. And thank you to the Montreal Alouettes for making this uh, uh, possible for your kindness and generosity. You're quite and welcome. <clears throat> Remember, Corey, you were around certainly at the time when the Montreal Alouettes rebranded because they were playing at the Olympic Stadium and things weren't all that good back, back in the day because the Olympic Stadium just was so, it was gray, it was dark, it didn't have that ambiance. Hey, Vincent Gargano, 2010, that's your answer. Well, we're going to be uh, checking that out at the end of the show. And uh, Vince, if you're right, you could be... Uh, uh, one of the uh, participants that will be winning the um, the tickets. So, like you were saying, uh, Corey, at one point the Alouettes had to rebrand because it wasn't working out at the um, uh, the Olympic Stadium, and they changed their name and their logo to this. You remember this? <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! Oh boy! Now we're really going back. Yes, I do. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, well, and, you know what? That's when I had a lot more hair. <laughs> you, you and me both. You and me both. <laughs> My hair was just like this. Yeah, yeah. I hear you. So, Corey, the CFL has a very exciting product on the field. 
Okay, if you compare the CFL to the NFL, there are many differences, both with the number of players on the field and the size of the field. So tell us what the differences are in terms of the number of players on the field and also the game itself, how it's played. Well, you know, I can I can go on forever, but I think people, you know, just to give people like a bird's eye view uh, of the CFL versus the NFL, the, the, obviously the first one, uh, which is blatant, is three downs versus four downs. So, uh, you know, for uh, for those people that are not familiar with that, you know, you need to get you have three opportunities to make ten yards, whereas in the NFL it's four tries to make. 10 yards. So that, that's the first thing. And the other thing is the field is much bigger. So um, in the CFL, it's 110 yards uh, from end zone to end zone. Uh, NFL, it's 100 yards. And, and then the other thing is you have 12 players versus 11 players. So uh, it makes the game, it's, it's a different game. So a lot of times you, you might feel that it's the same game, uh, but at the same time, it's, it's totally different. Strategically, it's different. Uh, the field's a little wider, hence why you can get that 12th player in. Uh, and there's more of a search, uh, sense of urgency when you actually have three downs versus the fourth downs, right? So you really have to go in, you know, it's more of a, a passing game in that sense because it's easier to get yards versus passing versus running. And the NFL, you have four downs, right? You have that extra down. So um, those are pretty much the big, the big uh, differences between both games. And who is the 12th player on the field, both defensively and offensively? Well, what's his title? Well, it's, it's not necessarily title per se, because it depends on the style of offense that you're running, right? So you can basically um, move people around. You can have an extra, you can have an extra receiver if you want. Uh, you might have a, a fullback, uh, someone that's blocking for the running back. So it all depends on how you're strategically lining your guys up. Um, on defense, it could be an extra linebacker. It could be an extra safety. Um, it all depends on what, what kind of defense you're running as well. And there's Teresa. He, she gave us an answer. She typed in 2010, just like Vincent Gargano. We'll find out <laughs> at the end of the show. Uh, thank you, everybody, for participating. Uh, Vincent and Teresa, thank you so much as well for giving us your answers. Uh, Corey has there. I mean, this is something that, it's inevitable. If it didn't happen, it has to happen. Has the NFL ever played a game against the CFL, or have there been games, in, interleague games? From my understanding, years ago, um, the, prior to the NFL being the um, the juggernaut that it is, um, there was a lot. There were games that were played between the CFL uh, and the NFL. Um, I believe, don't quote me, I believe, I think it was Chicago Bears had played the, the you know, the, the Alouettes at a particular point. I remember seeing something a little while back uh, regarding that. Um, I don't know in what sense. I don't know if it was like for a championship. I don't know if it was, uh, if it was just a promotional thing. But I do know that they have played each other in the past. Well, as a matter of fact, Corey, I can elaborate on that a little bit. Oh, oh Good. Educate okay. me. Okay. That game, okay, the CFL's Montreal Alouettes hosted the NFL Chicago Bears at Molson Stadium in Montreal on August 5th, 1961, in one of several ex exhibition games played between teams from both leagues since 1941. Mm. So the first half of the game between the Bears and the Owls, it was played under Canadian football rules, three downs, a pickup, a first down, and 12 players per team, while the sef second half was played according to NFL rules. So Chicago mm -hmm. trailed 9-7 before scoring 27 consecutive points in a dominating second half to row to a victory. The game is most notable for the bench-clearing brawl that led to four players' ejections <laughs> following a late hit by an Alouette player on the Bears' uh, tackle, Stan Fanning. It almost sounds. It almost looks as if these guys watch an NHL game. Maybe. Oh, <laughs> like oh, this, you know. A bench clearing brawl. 
Hey, you do your homework. Boy, oh boy, you dug all that up. That's good. Well, you know, it's part of the show. It's part of a responsibility to pre present a quality product to the fans. And, you know, nice job. the LOS are a great organization. You're a fantastic guest, and we owe it to you. Thank you. No, I appreciate that. I'm going to do a little research tonight on that as well. Do you get to hang out with some of the Alouette um, alumni players? Right. Do you? I do. No, I, I thought you were going to. Yeah, well, I do. Um, you know, I, when I work in the office, some of them uh, come by. And and my, my, my favorite, the, the fa my favorite gentleman that, that you know, that uh, salutes us or comes and talks to us is Mr. De La Riva. <laughs> and, and, and um, Mr. De La Riva, for those that don't know, he's, he's a quite a tall gentleman, broad. And, you know, I guess, I guess the, he, you know, he's getting there, he's getting up there in age, but he talks with his deep voice. <laughs> he'll, he'll come over and he'll shake my, and I, and I feel like a little kid, like he shake. How are you doing, young man? And and he shakes and he shakes my hand, and I feel like he's gonna crush every bone in my hand. And, and the gentleman is like, you know, I guess he's you know, Mr. De La Rio is maybe in his seventies. Oh wow! Like, oh, yeah, I'm like, holy cow! Like, you know, jeez. And, and and besides Peter De La Riva, is there uh, are there any other alumni you get to have? You know, well, the hangout. Well, the, you know, we we have players that come and go. You know, we have guys that come in the office and. Um, you know, they hang out with us and say hi, or they're coming in to do some French courses and stuff like that. Uh, it's important for them to, um, you know, be able to take advantage of the culture of Montreal. We live in a great place. So, you know, you were talking a little earlier about some of them uh, being from the States and so forth. So a lot of them want to learn French and be able to communicate and, and enjoy what Montreal has to offer. So uh, they come and take their lessons. So, uh, no, we, we, we see, you know, a, a guy that's a great guy is John Bowman that recently retired, uh, one of my favorite uh, players uh, and all-around good guy. We went uh, through some gloomy years here in Montreal in terms of football. Um, unfortunately, in 1987, the uh, Alouette suspended operations up until the year 1996. Uh, did, can you recall those years when football was absent from Montreal? Well, um, yes and no. Like, you know, as a fan, you know, I, obviously I recognize when the Alouettes left and, and it wasn't fun. You know, I had to you know, adopt another team, which I will not uh, say who on camera. Um, now that might get me in a little trouble, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it, it is what it is, you know. I, I think more importantly, uh, we have to celebrate that we have it back and we have to celebrate that we need to keep them here, you know. So, uh, you know, uh, post-pandemic, uh, coming back, coming out and so supporting your Alouettes and supporting local businesses, period, not just Alouettes. Uh, local businesses. A lot of businesses are are struggling right now, and you need to get out and support them as as much as you can. You know, and and uh, you know, a, a lot of times when I'm talking to a lot of companies and so forth, uh, I tell a lot of the companies, hey, you know, do something for your staff. You know, for all those people that are small business owners or people that are business owners, uh, you know, treat your staff uh, to uh, to a game, uh, organize a group, come out and support us, um, come out and uh, you know kick off kick you what's what's the expression take a load off your feet and uh, you know enjoy a game you know and and you're if, if you're scared about the social distancing you're outside <laughs> you know uh, a lot of times people um, don't have the opportunity to you know have board meetings like they want now or uh, people are feeling alien not alien but people are feeling alone because they're working from home and so forth um, and I think you know getting outside and coming to a game uh, once a year, uh, for people that are uh, just a casual fan or not even a fan at all, just but wanting to get out, um, I think it's a perfect opportunity. I think it's a win-win. It's a no-brainer, if you ask me. Well, in 1993, uh, the CFL did something uh, very, um, very daring. They expanded into the American market. And yeah. They added eight teams. And yeah. uh, just to go back memory lane, let's recall what the names of these teams were. Well, you had the, okay. go ahead, uh, Corey. Uh, no, no, I was gonna say I don't listen. I uh, see how how <laughs> how much I can. I remember one was called uh, who was a posse. I think the Las one. Vegas posse. Right, uh, there was one uh, uh, stallions, right? Obviously, the stallions. Baltimore stallions, right? 
Um, what is it? Um, I think uh, gold, gold rush or gold, gold something. The Sacramento like? gold miners. Gold miners. There you go. Um, and I, th that's all. You got me there. There was hey, eight. Yeah. I got three out of eight. That's Corey, not bad you know, for twenty five years ago. <laughs> you, you know what, Corey? With those answers, you what? just won tickets to the next Alouettes game. Oh, you know, serious. I, yeah, Corey. You know Oops. what? I might Oops. just pop by. <laughs> uh -oh. Corey. Okay, just to um, <laughs> just to go through the list here of the um, the expansion teams, they had the San Antonio Texans that changed their name to the San Antonio Riders. Okay, we mentioned the Baltimore Stallions, the Las Vegas the Las Vegas Posse, Sacramento Gold Diggers, the Shreveport Pirates. Holy cow! Okay, and how about the Memphis Showboats? Showboats, there you go. <laughs> Showboats, originally named the Mad Dogs. And last but not least, the Birmingham Barracudas. Barracudas. Yeah. So that's a team I didn't get to see very much of. <laughs> I wonder if they played that during the, you know, if they scored a touchdown. What was the song? Yeah, Barracuda, you know? No? Oh, by heart. There Barracuda. you go. Right. They probably yeah. did. I wonder if they did. Yeah, yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. Of the expansion teams in the American market, the most successful team was the Baltimore Stallions, later to be named cfl colts because it was a conflict with a name that belonged to a team that was in the nfl at one point they owned the rights to it and it was a name that had to be changed mm -hmm. they were averaging between thirty-five thousand and thirty-seven thousand fans per game wow okay so that's pretty amazing mm -hmm. corey tell mm -hmm. us what is the average attendance for a cfl game both in the regular season and in the playoffs well, I don't, I don't have those numbers. I, I don't know. I can just tell you what our, our facility holds over 20, I, th I think it's 21,000 people, 21 and a half, I believe. Um, I don't know. And every stadium is different, right? So our stadium is a stadium that's been around for over 100 years. So it's obviously a, a smaller stadium versus some of the ones that you have out west that are a little bit more modern. Uh, but our stadium has a little bit more charm. So uh, we enjoy our stadium. I don't. I don't know. To be honest with you, I don't know what what the the tendencies are around the league. Well, I'm going to tell you one thing. I like the um, the fact that there's 21,000 fans instead of 60,000 because yeah. you just feel like closer to the field. Right. You know, I, I I totally agree with you. It's 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 very you know I deal with a lot of customers uh, that are from out of town sometimes, and we talk about different facilities. And I'll say, oh, you know what? I like your stadium. Uh, you know, like in in Regina, they have a Mosaic Field, which is a new field. And I had an opportunity to visit a couple of years ago when I went with the team to on a fan tr fan plane trip. Um, and uh, what they do is they they said they they well they said like we love your stadium because it's intimate it's intimate uh, you're able to see from anywhere uh, you know it's smaller there's charm to it um, the fact that it is a hundred years old uh, it wow. brings you know, yeah it's over a hundred years old and how can you say it? it's not um, in, in French there's a expression say copy conform which basically carbon copy right in, in in so many words right so a lot of these newer stadiums that's what they are right it's just there's no charm to it it's, it's the exact same thing but ours you come in and it's like wow this is nice it's nostalgic you know so baltimore stallions are the only american football team to ever win a gray cup yeah in the cfl yeah and what happened is that they win the Grey Cup that year and the following year because that the uh, uh, Baltimore um, uh, franchise actually was able, they got permission to get their own team, the Baltimore Ravens. Yeah. That's why the Baltimore Stallions decided that uh, they wouldn't continue because it, it would have been futile competing against the NFL. It was just too much, right. uh, too much competition. Yeah. But that's the sad news. But the good news is, is that the Baltimore franchise, along with uh, Tracy Ham, right, moved back to Montreal in 1996. And we've had football since. Mm -hmm. And we've won some other great cups. Right. Be careful not to give away anything. Else. Exactly. I was about to say that. Don't let the cat out the bag. So once again, folks, the question is, what is the last year that the Montreal Alouettes won the great cup? So you still have time. 
We're going to be selecting our winners because we have two pairs of tickets within the next two hours of the show. And we'll be announcing the winner on next week's show. Corey, where has time gone? Where has time gone? Are you telling me we're already over? This is done already? Well, you know what? That's the sad part about it. Is that oh, it's man. Okay. too bad for the audience because I could keep going here. But yeah. the good news is that Patty and Jenny are going to be able to come and meet you. Uh, you know, touch base with you. It's a it's a baseball uh, expression, but it doesn't matter. There's no base. Right. We, we we got you, Robert. Don't worry about that. Corey, what are your closing comments? And then uh, I'll let you uh, go out and uh, say uh, thank you to the uh, crowd for tuning in. So, what are you in your closing comments? What do you um what do you suggest for youngsters who are playing football nowadays uh what is the best advice you can give them in order to keep their dreams focused because there's a lot of local talent here from quebec that actually make the alouettes well listen um what do i tell kids have fun you know th this is you know you know enjoy yourselves you know get outside play have fun. Get out of the basement. Stop the video games. There's 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 time to play the video games, but get out and have some fun. Meet new people. Uh, play a sport, um, and not just football. Play any sport, but football is a great sport. And now there's so many different opportunities for people from different walks of life, different uh, backgrounds, uh, boys, girls to play football. Uh, enjoy it. It's a great game. And um, th that's pretty much it. That's what I would tell you. Enjoy yourselves. And folks, don't forget to encourage our, uh, our birds, our skylights, yes. our alouettes. Oh, Robert, with the, enough with that picture. <laughs> and, uh, bring the angry bird back at least. Not that little. That little. <laughs> there you go. There encourage you go. <laughs> our, our heroes, our Montreal alouettes. Go out and uh, watch their games. They got a great product in the field. Friday. Friday, Friday, come, Friday. Come, come, come support us Friday, and then if we win Friday, then we're in the playoffs the next week after at home on the twenty eighth. So you know what, and you all know where to go. So give me a call, Corey. Thank you so much for being our guest this evening. Thanks for having me, Robert. Okay, really stick, appreciate it. it was a lot around, of fun. Stick around, bud. We're going to be uh, speaking in a bit. I appreciate that. Have a good one, everyone. Have a good night. There you have it. That was our guest tonight, the uh, senior account manager at the Montreal Alouettes, Corey Ramirez, our amazing guest this evening. Thank you so much, Corey. Uh, a reminder that this upcoming Wednesday on Noon Hour Out of the Box uh, that I will co-host with Esther Brzezinski, we're going to be talking about empaths. So that's a show you don't want to miss. That's Wednesday at noon on the Robert D'Alessio Facebook page, Bobby Short Shorts YouTube channel, and on the Esther's Breeze YouTube channel. Stay tuned. Next week, when we're going to have another amazing guest. She's making a comeback appearance. It's going to be the Montreal award-winning filmmaker, Teresa Picciano. She's going to be back on her show. Hey, Terry, we're delighted to have you back, and our audience is going to just love that you're back. And we're going to be able to finish our November month and kick it off right into action with more football talk when we will meet with retired football player who played 11 seasons with the Montreal Alouettes, Anwar Stewart. He's going to be our guest. So um, you want to stick around for that great show. Right now, he is currently the defensive line coach for the Kentucky Wildcats. So you don't want to miss that show. We had a great show Coming up next week, it's Teresa Picciano, a local filmmaker from Montreal. You don't want to miss that. In the following week, we have Anwar Stewart. Everybody, thank you so much for tuning into our show. You made it so much fun. Don't forget, you still have a chance to answer the question, when was the last year the Montreal Alouettes won the Great Cup? We're going to be announcing the winner within the two next hours after the show. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Same place, same time, same reason. Ciao.